We all go through different chapters in our lives, some stranger than others. Welcome to Strange Chapters, where we bring you true stories of the strange, the macabre, the paranormal, and the supernatural. So sit back, relax, and let's get to this week's featured author and their stories. Hey everybody, welcome back to Strange Chapters. I am your host and narrator, Eric Freeman Sims. This week, I am so excited to bring you these three strange stories. It is from a good buddy of mine, and he is one of the fan favorite guests over on the Unseen Paranormal Podcast. Mr. Steve Stockton has given me permission to do three stories out of his book, Strange Things in the Woods, a collection of terrifying tales. And you can find Steve's books on Amazon, Kindle, barnesandnoble.com, and anywhere else fine books are sold. And I will have all of his links in the show notes to so go check out all of his books. I think Steve has almost 20 books now, so go check out all the awesome stuff that Steve does. And check out his Missing Person Mysteries channel on YouTube and also his other YouTube channels as well. I will have all those links in the show notes. So if you're ready, sit back, relax, and let's get strange. Story 1. The Abandoned House This happened in the mountains of North Carolina. My husband at the time was in the military, and we were stationed at Camp Lejeune. One weekend, we and another military couple decided to go camping in the rugged Appalachian Mountains on the other side of the state. After setting up camp, we decided to hike around for a bit in the hilly, mountainous terrain. Deep in the woods in a little hollow, imagine our surprise when we chanced upon an abandoned Victorian house. It was almost overgrown with kudzu vines, but we still managed to find a way inside and decided to explore. Once in, we were amazed at the surprisingly good condition of the inside of the house. Upon further inspection, we found the house to be fully furnished and also found clothing and even old children's toys. It was more than a little creepy, and we all got the feelings we shouldn't be there. It was as if the people who lived there had just stepped out and would return at any moment. Our husbands were just as mystified as we girls were, although they didn't seem as scared. My husband, Richard, even began checking the walls for any hidden passages, thinking perhaps the family had gone into hiding for some reason and then perished, trapped inside the walls. I can't express how much the house still looked lived in. There was clothes laid out on the still-made beds, and plates and silverware set out on the dinner table. Everything was covered with a somewhat heavy layer of dust, so it was obvious the place hadn't been lived in for decades. This was in the early 1960s, although the musty calendar on the wall was from 1909. Was it even possible that no one had entered this dwelling in over 50 years? The longer we spent in the house, the more scared my female friend and I became, eventually becoming almost hysterical. Eventually, after much pleading, our husbands decided we should leave, although they would have been happier to stay and explore the house more. After we had left and the shivers wore off, all we could discuss on the drive back home was how isolated the house was. It was literally in the middle of the woods, and the nearest paved highway was miles away. A few weeks later, our husbands planned a trip back, alone, to continue exploring. My friend and I were just fine with that. Although I was curious about the house, I had no desire to visit again after the sense of fright that enveloped me there. However, when the guys came back home the Sunday evening, after their planned trip, the story became even stranger. Although they were sure of the exact location, they'd been unable to find the house, and had spent the entire weekend wandering the woods. Even though they remembered and recognized natural landmarks, no trace of the house could be found. They even stopped at a roadside general store a dozen or so miles from where the house had been, and when they inquired about the house, the proprietor emphatically denied that any such house existed. When my husband and his friend persisted, the man at the general store suddenly became very angry and told them to leave, adding that if they knew what was good for them, they should forget the house and never come back. They ignored the warning and went back on two other occasions, but could never find the house again. And like the owner of the general store, any of the locals whom they chanced upon and asked about the place refused to talk about or even acknowledge it. I know what we saw, and I know it was real, but not being able to find it again, and the local folks not want to talk about it, only adds to the mystery. Do we chance upon the side of some unspeakable tragedy? I may never know the answer, but I will always wonder about the abandoned house deep in the woods. Story 2. Evil in the Woods The weirdest, creepiest stuff I've ever found in the woods 
happened when I was a teenager. I'd only been driving a few years and had an old 71 Chevrolet Impala. It was a road boat and gas guzzler for sure. But I'd love to get out at night and drive around by the moonlight. There was an abandoned subdivision tract I'd found during my ramblings and decided to go back one night and check it out. There were no houses, only what seemed like miles of paved road that went far back into the hills. The original developer had gone bankrupt, which is why it was left in the state it was in. All the building lots long since overgrown with brush and sapling pines. On this particular night, I'd found the furthest extreme of the paved road blocked by a fallen tree. Feeling somewhat adventurous, I got out of my car with a flashlight to see if the tree could be moved. However, it was a beast of an old rotten oak and must have weighed close to a ton. There was no way I could move it by myself. Deciding that I wasn't finished exploring for the night, I decided to lock my car and go ahead on foot. I figured since the road was blocked, I was safe, as there would be no one else in the area. After about half a mile, the pavement stopped and continued on as a gravel road leading up a steep hill. I sallied forth, undaunted, happily stomping along in the gravel while enjoying the noise it made as it crunched beneath my boots. At the top of the hill, the gravel road ended as well, and now the road became nothing more than a rutted path through the high weeds and briars, with trees flanking either side. I was still feeling adventurous and decided to press on, determined to see how far I could go and where I would eventually end up. About a half mile along the footpath, it curved sharply to the right. At the corner where it curved, I was playing my flashlight over the woods when the beam suddenly struck something out of the ordinary. On the slope of a short, steep bank, someone had fashioned a crude arrow shape out of some logs and branches of varying size. It looked too perfect to be random, so I was sure it was some kind of trail marker. I debated for a couple minutes, then decided to abandon the path and see where the primitive trail marker led. At the crest of the bank where the arrow pointed, I found another arrow, but well-worn path, which led deeper into the woods. I forged ahead, enjoying the adventure and solace that comes with being out in nature. The path twisted and turned a bit, but was leading uphill to the top of the ridge. When I arrived at the top after a good half hour of hiking, I thought I would perhaps be met with a vista overlooking the city or the nearby lake. Instead of what I found made my blood run cold. Where the ground leveled out in a fairly large clearing was a gigantic pentagram made from carefully arranged logs. I mean, this thing was huge. There were other logs set up outside the circle of the pentagram, which reminded me of altars. There were also upside-down crosses planted at various spots. By now, I was actually sweating and shaking, jumping at every sound I heard and playing my flashlight all over the trees, trying to catch sight of anyone who might be hiding. I caught a glimpse of something in the middle of the large pentagram and shined my light on it for a better look. It turned out to be the remains of some large bird, perhaps even a duck or goose, which had been burned. I realized that whoever had done all this was serious about it. It was too intricate for just some metalhead kids messing around out in the woods. There was some sort of satanic type cult or group or whatever which met to perform blood sacrifices. I decided it was high time I got out of there, and I started moving as fast as I dared back through the woods. After what seemed like hours, I finally arrived back in my car. Written in mud across my windshield was a single word, Beware. I grabbed an old t-shirt out of the back seat and scrubbed it off the best I could and then jumped in, silently praying my car would start. Thankfully it did, and I'm sure I broke the speed limit all the way home. I never shared my experience with anyone, and I never went exploring anywhere near the derelict subdivision or surrounding woods again. It still frightens me to this day to even think about what might have happened if I'd shown up on the wrong night or at the wrong time and happened across the people and their evil practices in the woods. I still have a sense of adventure, but learned some very valuable lessons that night. Never go exploring alone. Always let someone at home know where you're going and realize that there are some things that are better off left alone. People who do things in secret and hidden out of sight do so for a reason. As the crudely written message on my car windshield stated, Beware. Story 3. The Black Dog I was just a child when this happened, about ten or so, but I've never forgotten it and I never will. It was in the fall of the year, so it would have been early October. I believe it was just a few days before Halloween. We had gone up into Ohio to visit my grandmother, who still lived on the family farm after my grandfather passed away the year before. I was out wandering around in the huge yard and decided to go for a stroll through the cornfield adjacent to the yard. Now, if you've never seen a cornfield in Ohio or Indiana, these can be massive, covering many, many acres. The ears of corn had already been harvested, and I was having a grand time walking through the dead stalks that had yet to be plowed under. 
I remember it seeming spooky, like that Stephen King movie, Children of the Corn. Heck, I half expected Bigfoot to pop out from between the rows. After what seemed like miles, it was probably only a quarter mile or so, I came out of either the back or the side of the cornfield. I had been running around like a wild ape and wasn't sure which way was which at this point. The rows all looked the same after a while if you're a kid and not paying attention. I didn't see the farmhouse anywhere, so instead had the not-so-bright idea to head into the woods. If I had found the cornfield confusing, then the woods were a hundred times more so, at least. I was a smart Alex suburban kid, we lived on a cul-de-sac for crying out loud, who thought he knew everything there was to know about the woods. Boy, was I ever in for a surprise. I was just moseying along, looking at rocks and trees and birds and squirrels, when I noticed it was starting to get dark. It was already kind of dark in the woods anyway, but I hadn't noticed the quickly setting sun. So it would be really, really dark soon. Instead of panicking, I did have at least enough sense to keep my head about me and ignore the urge to just start running in any particular direction. Although now I know that the best thing to do if you're lost in the woods is to stay in one place. Otherwise, you end up walking in circles without even realizing it. I decided to hike my way out of the woods. I had no idea which way the farm or the main road or anything was, so I just picked a direction and started walking. It was completely pitch black in the woods. I didn't have any kind of light with me, of course, and I couldn't see any lights anywhere in the distance. I just kept walking and finally sat down beneath a huge tree and wept. I was truly, absolutely lost in the woods. After I'd been sitting for probably about 15 minutes or so, I stopped crying and decided to get up and start walking again. As I continued to make my way through the maze of trees and dense brush, I heard a sound off to my right. Thinking it might be someone looking for me, I called out. No response came, but I could hear the noises getting closer. A couple minutes later, the biggest dog I've ever seen poked his massive head out of the bush. The dog was immense, like a Labrador, but even bigger. Looking back, it may have been a Mastiff or some kind of Great Dane hybrid. At first, I was sure the huge beast was going to eat me, or at least tear me to shreds. And at that point, I almost didn't care. Instead, the dog walked right over to me, and while wagging his massive tail, licked my hand. I petted him for a few minutes and was amazed at how beautiful he was. He wasn't wearing a collar, but he looked healthy and very clean. His coat was soft and shiny, not ragged, and full of birds and ticks like you might find on a dog roaming in the woods. I began walking again, at least now I had some company. The dog eventually began walking in front of me, and every few feet would stop and look back, as if urging me to keep following him. I was so tired and all I wanted to do was find a place to sit down, but it was really getting chilly now in the dark, so I did the best I could to keep the dog in sight and kept moving. After what seemed like an hour, we stepped out of the woods onto a paved road. Civilization at last. However, I wasn't sure whether to follow the road to the left or to the right. I looked at the dog, and as if he understood my predicament, he started trotting off down the blacktop to the left. I figured it was a 50-50 shot anyway, so I continued following him. There were still no houses or lights in sight, but the night was clear enough that I could follow the dog, which was following the road. I did find it kind of strange that he didn't stop and sniff things every few feet like most dogs do, but I was too tired to care. Soon I began to see some lights off in the distance. It looked like houses so I hopefully had gone in the right direction. As I continued along, still following the dog, I saw a pair of automobile headlights approaching in the distance. I almost started to hide in case it was some kind of weird stranger, but instead decided to stay by the road, but got safely off onto the shoulder. The dog stood by my side, waiting. As the vehicle drew nearer, I recognized it as my uncle's dilapidated old Buick. I was rescued. The car pulled over and my dad jumped out. He was thankful to see me, as I had been gone for hours and no one knew where I was. He said they'd been out for the last couple of hours, driving the back roads looking for me, while some of my cousins had gone into the woods, and another batch had headed over to the nearby lake. Once I assured him I was okay, I piled into the back seat and fell fast asleep, enjoying the warmth of the Buick's heater. I didn't even remember arriving back at the house, as my dad had carried me inside and put me to bed. The next morning over breakfast, all the conversation was about my little adventure the night before. I told the whole story about becoming lost and how the big black dog had led me out of the woods and in the right direction toward the house. I asked both my dad and uncle if they hadn't seen the dog waiting beside me when they stopped in the car, but neither one had any idea what I was talking about. They hadn't seen any dog, just a tired, cold boy standing and shivering on the side of the road. My uncle asked around, and no one had ever seen or heard of such a large black dog being owned by anyone in the area. This was the type of farming community that was pretty tight-knit. Everyone knew everyone else. I often wonder if maybe I'd imagined the dog, but a part of me knows better. I remember what his tongue felt like when he licked my hand and how soft and warm his coat felt when I stroked him. Maybe the dog was some sort of guardian angel. 
I suppose an angel could take on any form, and I would have been a lot more scared of a strange person than a big black dog. Either way, he led me out of the woods, and I'll never forget. All right, everybody. Hopefully you enjoyed those three stories from Steve Stockton's book, Strange Things in the Woods, a collection of terrifying tales. I will have all of Steve's links in the show notes so you can go grab your own copy of the book and also check out and subscribe to Steve's YouTube channels. Links are in the show notes as well. So thank you for tuning in today. Stay safe out there and stay strange. <laughs>